Hi, I'm Andrew McCray. Welcome to our farm and ranch in Northwest Missouri. My great-great-grandfather settled here in 1910, and I'm the fifth generation to grow crops and livestock here. As a farmer myself, I know the highs and lows of this life, the issues we confront every day, some new, some as old as farming itself. This show is a place to talk with farmers and others in the ag industry about topics that mean something to us, topics that can improve the present and future of our operations. This is Farming the Countryside. Doug Hensley is president of Real Estate Services at Hertz Farm Management, and we're certainly going to visit about lots of things under the sun, dealing with land and rental and tighter crop margins and so forth. Doug, I appreciate you taking time to uh, join me here. I'm sure you're getting a lot of questions these days as we have, well, we're going to have a good crop, but maybe we aren't going to get paid as much for it. Is that how you would see it this year? You know, yeah, I, I think that's exactly right, Andrew. Thanks for having me on. And uh, yeah, every year is different. I think everybody in agriculture kind of expects every year to be different, but this one's going to be a little bit of a shock to the system and get us back to, you know, maybe what we have uh, have more commonly become accustomed to over the years. You know, the 21s and 22s and 23s are a lot of fun and they're really profitable, but um, years like this where it's going to be a little skinnier margins is, uh, yeah, uh, o- over time, I think we've dealt with this more than we have the big spikes in income. You're right. The last few years, as you mentioned, have been more fun, but perhaps we're just back to more normal. Would that be right? Fair enough. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think um, in times when margins are really uh, are really fat, like we've had in recent years, we maybe lose a little bit of discipline as business owners and uh, decision makers. And when things uh, tighten up like they are, yeah, we we have a tendency to sharpen our pencil and, and just do a little better job overall. Yeah, we'll jump into some specifics, but I'm interested in, in what you're mentioning there because this has been on my mind. The discipline, is there any one place that you suggest people start with that? Or I suppose it will vary somewhat by their operation, but where do you begin to find more discipline in these times? Well, I I think across agriculture, it, it, right? There's disciplines on both ends of the hose. There's you can you can make more revenue, so doing a great job in marketing a crop and going about it that way is one way to increase your discipline and and try to add to your margin. The other way is to reduce expense, and so whether that is in how you buy your inputs. Uh, or the decisions that you make mid-season uh, with whether you, you know, if you have rescue treatments and things like that, that you're you're kind of making hard decisions on, you know, when we have 550 or $6 corn, those are pretty easy decisions to make. We're, uh, but when we're dealing with $4 corn or even 390 or 380 corn, gosh, that's a lot harder. And, and you know, you, you really have to do the math to figure out if you're protecting yield. And uh, so the discipline all comes into play and it, it comes into play both on the revenue creation side as well as uh, protecting um, that as well as the, the other end and, and how you spend the revenue that you do create or yet you expect to. So both come into play for sure across all of agriculture and every business is going to make those decisions and have that exercise that they're going to work through with their staff. You know, a farming business, you're looking at corn and soybeans. Uh, You know, an input supplier is looking at it in terms of gallons of product and acres covered and that sort of thing. And a farm management or real estate uh, auction business is going to look at it uh, from their specific, both revenue side as well as expense side. So we're all dealing with it because all of our agribusiness industry is connected at a different level. And so, yeah, I think, I think those are the decisions and the the exercises that people will be going through between now and year end. uh, As we look at, you know, people, uh, if they're borrowing money or whatever on operating lines, those are the sort of things that a lender is going to want to see and, and banks are doing it as well. Uh, So, you know, we're, we're all, we're all in business at some level, so we all have to have to go through those exercises. As you look out to the landscape there, and, and let's go to real estate first, 
are you seeing that land values are at least holding or have we moved back any we of course have higher interest rates and we don't have as big of a revenue side yep. on those corn and bean acres what are you seeing out there nationally yep i think it kind of depends on where you're at um we have seen uh here in 2024 we have seen some softness show up in certain places some more than others and i think that uh you know, when you're in the middle of a growing season, you know, I can point to Southern Minnesota or Northwest Iowa as a couple, as a really easy example. Those are areas that have had uh, a difficult growing season. Um, they either, you know, had too much rain in the middle and really made a mess of the crop or struggled to get a crop in to begin with. And then it just never stopped raining. And there's just, if you go up to Southern Minnesota, which is a very productive agricultural area, um, they're having a poor year overall. And so there is a potential, I think, for more weakness in areas that aren't going to grow the bushels this year on top of lower prices. And so there's that expectation that I think things may be a little softer in certain markets like that. Um, and, and on the other hand, you go to eastern Iowa, central and eastern Iowa, and frankly, parts of western Iowa, and eastern Nebraska, you're going to have a great crop. You get over across the Mississippi into Illinois and in southern Wisconsin, where they grow uh, a fair amount of row crop production in southern Wisconsin. I think those areas are going to have outstanding crops. And so, um, yeah, we're, we obviously don't have the price uh, that we would that we would hope for at the beginning of the year. But I think for a lot of people going back to the discipline of um, marketing grain and being consistent and running a marketing plan. We're not selling all our crop at what the board's at on, you know, August 19th, which is pretty ugly. Um, but we are going to have the bushels. And so that, uh, that helps to offset it. And because of that in the Eastern Corn Belt, I feel like we're going to have, uh, overall stable, uh, an overall stable land market. You know, I was talking to one of my guys earlier today, Andrew, and he asked me about, you know, how much do I think the market is down in a particular area? And I said, well, you know, every every neighborhood's a little bit different because there's other factors that come into play beyond yield and price. There's the volume of sales. And, and, and so in those areas where we're seeing maybe a few more sales than normal and some of that local capital is getting used up, the next sale that comes along may look a little weak compared to an area that hasn't had much for sale and hasn't had much competition to soak up that local capital along with the, you know any investor interest that may come into a farm so overall everyone would say gosh i think this land market is is holding in there better than i expected when we've seen corn prices down a buck 50 or two dollars a bushel and soybeans have have dropped what two to three dollars a bushel in the last 12 months and so the environment has changed the land market's always a little slow to to catch up to that because it's a lagging situation in the land market based on profitability um, but there is expectation that we're going to see uh, or there's more pressure towards weakness than there is you know strength fanning the flame so to speak that we've enjoyed for the past several years as we enter this time of, of tighter margins, we have higher interest rates than we have had for several years. For sure. How much of an impact do you think that's having on the overall ag economy as we move forward? You know, I think I think on the machinery business, it's probably impacted things uh, thus far a little more uh, directly. I think on the land side of things, uh, it has a potential to have a, a real impact, but thus far, you know, we we close four to five hundred transactions a year um, and we just haven't seen a tremendous amount of borrowed money yet come into the marketplace. And that sounds crazy, you know, um, because there's so some of this land is so high priced and and it takes a lot of money to buy an 80 anymore. You know, a million dollars won't buy a decent 80 across the Midwest. Um, but the reality is, is that people have made a, a tremendous amount of money in recent years and uh, they've been i think they've been pretty disciplined in how they've deployed that and right now i would say people are being more protective of their working capital and they're 
you know, um, they're not going out and chasing farmland deals uh, in the way that they were trying to find farms and trying to expand their operation quite as overtly as what they were two years ago. But uh, people are still stepping up to the plate when a good uh, when a good farm that adjoins them, for example, comes to the market. I think the one place that the higher interest rate environment is impacting maybe most directly um, and it's not so much from a borrower's perspective, but it's it's competing for those investor dollars. Um, you know, when the interest rate environment was as low as it was for as long as it was, um, farmland with, what, two and a half to three and a half annual cash returns um, looked pretty attractive because, you know, the bond market was really weak and had very low margins. You know, a lot of people have a lot of money invested in the stock market. And so they said farmland's an alternative that is producing a yield uh, from a financial aspect. And it also has a potential for appreciation. And so we had a lot of investors who over the past decade entered the farmland market for the first time. Now, fast forward to where we are today and what's happened, um, you know, uh, Two and a half percent on a farm doesn't look quite as good when you can take your cash and put it in any country bank for, you know, you can get a, what, a 5% CD without looking too hard right now. And uh, we've also had a significant uh, appreciation of the asset class in general. So I think a lot of investors who are kind of agnostic as to the asset type that they own, they're saying, you know what, I'm not going to chase a farm in the same way that I did in 21 or 22 simply because I can take those dollars that I would otherwise invest in a farm, I can put them over here in a pretty, you know, almost a risk-free uh, asset that, you know, I can just sit on the sidelines for a while and see if this farmland market backs up. And then I can come back into the market, maybe at a, you know, a more advantageous timing perspective. So from a, from a interest rate perspective, we were so low for so long that that savers and people who had money were almost penalized for having cash. And that is not the case today. Um, that that has uh, that has reversed to some degree and savers are actually making some money on some cash today. And so I think some of those people who are straight up pure play investors, um, they they are looking maybe less favorably right now at farmland than what they were uh, for the last you know, two to three years, or maybe even the last decade, uh, when they felt like you could get a pretty good yield on a farm and, and other uh, alternative investments weren't quite as strong uh, uh, at that time as what they are today. Does that make sense? Sure. No, it does very much so. We, we tend to focus a lot on corn and beans and rightly yep. so and, and field crops, but over on the cattle side, a lot of cattle producers have seen some, some good profits. We've had some record prices. Does that impact anything on the land side for, for ground that's going back into pasture? We normally think of that ground as falling far behind the, the crop yeah. ground, but just curious what you're seeing with anything on the livestock, specifically the cattle. Yeah, from a from a total uh, from a total acres perspective across most of the Corn Belt, you don't see, um, you know, you don't see a ton of uh, cattle production in the same way. You know, when I was growing up, shoot, everybody had 50 to 100 head of cows and had some somewhat unproductive land that they ran pasture on. And some of that pasture was brought into production over the last 20 to 30 years. So pasture has become harder to find, um, particularly um, you get up, you know, in, in central Illinois, central Indiana, coming over into, you know, the the southern tier of counties in, in southern Iowa, there's a lot of pasture down there just because of the geography. And obviously in Missouri, which you're well aware of, uh, there's still a fair amount of pasture. But in some places, you kind of got to look to find some pasture. And so even, even without a strong cattle market, the pasture market in some of these heavy row crop areas has been the you know, the pastures worth some worth some money, um, both from a rental and especially from a purchase perspective in some of these more row crop heavy focused areas. And when we have a strong cattle market like we've had, shoot, I mean, across the livestock industry, cattle have been the bright spot for what a couple of years now. The hog business has been really tough, 
poultry has been uh, similarly not not so much fun, but the cattle business has been really good. So any area that you see uh, significant cattle influence, absolutely, it's playing into the strength in the local land market, uh, including uh, in areas where it's mostly row crop. But again, uh, for the few cows that are still there in those areas, like, you know, you get around Ames, Iowa, you kind of got to look for a piece of pasture, but uh, you don't have to drive more than more than an hour south and it's pretty prominent. And when guys are making money from being in the in the cattle business, yeah, it's it's playing a role. And as we get out into the plain states, uh, in Nebraska and Kansas and some other places, I think we're actually that has actually showed up a bit in those uh, in those central plain states uh, with the land market there being maybe a little stronger than uh, than some might expect who aren't paying attention to the livestock market very close. The fact that cattle have been have been a pretty big bright spot has has definitely lent itself to a to a very stable land market. You help a lot of landowners, of course, at Hertz uh, help manage some properties, even if they may not be on those properties right. anymore. Uh, any difference in expectations that you're seeing from folks now, or maybe you're having to help them with their expectations as we move into this market? Yeah, I think um, I think a lot of uh, a lot of landowners. Are, you know, one of the things that we try to do is educate clients. You know, we have uh, landowner seminars and we have obviously lots and lots of one-on-one -on -one relationships. And I, I think they do pay attention to what's happening in the country. Uh, a lot of these people, you know, that we work for, um, you know, they're from a rural area, even if they don't live there now, they've inherited assets in some cases. And so they're paying attention to what's happening. Um, expectations obviously in recent years when profits were going up you know they had very positive expectations and in these years where uh we've seen some of them some of the marketplace just just back up in several different ways yeah i think there's kind of a maybe a little bit of reset in in reality that is is going to play out this fall although you know in the early discussions that we've been having with farm operators across, really across the Corn Belt. Um, it, it goes back to what I said a little bit earlier. We're not selling all of our 2024 production at the at the low levels that commodity prices are currently at. If people had marketed grain, you know, a lot of people had forward contracted and we're not gonna see the total impact of this changing grain market until we get into 2025 in earnest, I think. Um, and because of that, Going into fall, um, a lot of the feedback we've gotten from farm operators is, yeah, there's probably going to be a little bit of pressure on rents as we go into the fall season. But if you're in an area that is going to have, I mean, there's going to be areas that have just phenomenal crops. And so uh, I, I think farm operators and most people in agriculture know how difficult it is to uh, to gain, you know, access to additional farm, land to farm and so forth. Um, I don't think there's going to be a big, a big, uh, a huge adjustment, I should say, in where rental rates are going to fall this fall. Yeah, there may be a little bit of pressure, uh, but overall, similar to land values holding in there, I think, I think there's uh, just uh, the early returns is, yeah, a little bit of pressure on rents, but not as much as as what we've seen corn and soybean prices fall, if that makes sense. It does. And as you've alluded to, it appears there's still a lot of money in the bank, so to speak. Perhaps folks have banked up some money from those good years. So perhaps we're going to run on that money for a little while before we see the weakness. Is that what you would say in some no, of the- I, 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 think that's to, I think that's totally what is happening. And again, people are being more careful with their working capital, because when they can see more profit that's going to be coming in, you know, the, the, I'll go back to the, the word discipline. People tend to, you know, be a little more free in the way they make decisions. And I think that uh, going into this fall and, and into the winter, making decisions going into the 2025 crop year, uh, people are, are going to be more guarded. Um, Instead of having six or eight people at a uh, land auction raising their hands and being aggressive, there may only be three or four or maybe only two or, you know, um, it's just not going to be as 
broad of a market and it's probably not going to have as as uh, as much depth in the market as what we have had um, but there's there's still plenty of money from what i have seen in the countryside uh, to compete if they choose to and it's just a matter of strategically long term how are they how are they approaching this downturn you know uh, for anybody who's been in agriculture we've all seen this movie before right i mean we run, we we go on this up and down uh, from trough to peak and each trough is a little higher than the last trough and each peak tends to be a little higher than the last one over time um, and we need to make sure that we manage our cash flows and our working capital such that we can we can deal with uh, that space between between the peaks and that's that's essentially what we're what we seem to be you know going through right now Doug, in the time we have left here, I'm just interested in other things you have on your mind because you deal with a lot of uh, farms and a lot of locations and a lot of different landowners. Yep. What other things should we be thinking about out there? So there's a couple of topics that just I keep getting asked about on a regular basis. Transition planning is one. Um, you know, every time we go into an environment uh, where things are a little tougher, some of the folks who had maybe uh, considered retiring several years ago, maybe put it off because they know that they're going into a time of great profit and opportunity. And um, I think there's going to be um, going into maybe what what looks like if we have a big crop, we're going to have a have a little bit of a hangover in the grain markets for maybe a year or two or three or four or five. And so people making decisions whether they are going to transition into retirement and how that's going to play out and just being prepared for that, I think, is a topic that people just can't get enough information about. And so that is something that we're always visiting with people about. The other thing that I think um, has been interesting to watch is just uh, the acceptance and development of technology in agriculture. You know, going into this downturn, um, we probably have seen, you know, autonomous vehicles and and AI and some of these things that are helping us make decisions and and be really productive out in the field. Um, I think it'll be interesting to see can we can we afford to implement some of those things because technology costs money and whether that will will be at the top of the priority list for people will be interesting. And you know, I will tell you that the the COVID uh, the COVID twelve to twenty four month period uh, because. We couldn't be uh, together in the same ways that we had become accustomed. There was a tremendous amount of uh, just technological innovation um, from lots of different companies, from you know, from Zoom to being on these uh, you know video chats to how we deliver land auction services. You know, before it was uh, most land auctions before COVID were still in person, and there was. There was an, you know, there was an occasional remote bidder who may have been on the phone with someone. And in today's world, um, you know, the technology that we use to deliver land auctions, we do all kinds of virtual auctions and hybrid bidding. And, you know, it's just amazing how much uh, advancement we made because of limitation. Um, and in, in the case of COVID, it was limitation of being in groups. Um, in the case of the limitation that may be coming, um, it may be limitation in cash flow and where we choose to put dollars in the technology. And so that's going to be an interesting thing to watch and be a part of in the next few years. But uh, those are probably the two biggest topics that we get asked about most commonly is, hey, I'm thinking about transitioning and you know, I need to plan for the next generation. How can I keep them or get them involved in the business or I don't have a natural next generation coming into my business. What can I do to can either continue to own the farm or be a blessing to the next generation uh, as it relates to farm operations and, and helping people do that. And then, like I said, the technology side, that's always an important part of, uh, of what people are thinking about moving forward. So, Doug, lots of good information. I appreciate the time. It's always good to talk to you, Andrew. Thanks a bunch for having me.